Hello once again from Heirloom Books at 6239 North Clark Street in Chicago, Illinois. I'm Jeff Helgeson, and this is number 30 in the series of these Great Works Talks. What I thought I would do today is revisit some of the ideas I've spoken about previously, widening the literary topic somewhat to a more general humanities approach, including visual arts, music, philosophy, and history. Now, admittedly, this is no small task, but it does seem, to me at least, to have a simple enough foundation based upon the notion that the collective perspectives available through the thoughtful interpretation of any work of art can contribute to valuable and significantly meaningful understanding. Simply stated, no one is able to experience everything in life, nor in fact would anyone truly want to encounter and endure all of what's available through the artistic expression both for emotional and intellectual, affective and cognitive awareness regarding the um, course of human events. In the simplest terms, I think it can be said that what artists of all kinds routinely put into the works that they create are the unique aspects of their personal intuitive and intellectual understanding. And over time, what this has produced is a genuinely precious record of human consciousness from throughout history and from across the whole of the world's continually evolving cultural landscape. The timeless insights into life expressed in the first work addressed within these talks, Civilization's earliest narrative, the Epic of Gilgamesh, have been augmented and enriched through art inspired by other works that have also been discussed, including the Hindu Bhagavad Gita, the Egyptian Book of Dead, and the various testaments which comprise the collective anthology, commonly referred to as the Bible, or the book, a term derived from the ancient Greek word biblion. Add to this the legacy, beginning with the Iliad and Odyssey of Homer, and extending through the histories of Herodotus and Thesiclides, the philosophical speculations of Thales, Heraclitus, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, in addition to Epicurus and Lucretius and Marcus Aurelius, Sir Thomas More, and even Machiavelli, as well as Voltaire. And what develops is a background against which even the most contemporary of events can be assessed and interpreted. For example, while much of the world today, during the month of May in 2022, stands in awe with regard to the amazing resolve of the people of Ukraine in response to the invasion of their country by Russia. Precedence and insight can be found in works of art and written descriptions of events dating as far back as to 490 and 480 BCE and then to 1588, 1812, and 1941 through 1944, as well as within the plays by both the ancient Greek writer Aeschylus and Elizabethan England's William Shakespeare, in addition to depictions of France's Joan of Arc resisting English invaders and the uh, disasters of war paintings by Spain's Francisco Goya, including the uh, 3rd of May representing a crucifixion eluding killing by a French army's death squad. With the 480 BCE defeat of an invasion into Greece, led by the Persian king Darius at the Battle of Marathon, 26 miles from Athens, as commemorated in a perennial foot race and test of human endurance, a historic pattern was established that was repeated a decade 
later, as described by Herogenes, with the defeat of the successive Persian emperor Xerxes' invasion of Greece in hope of avenging the previous loss, resulting in a further precedent of outnumbered free people defending their homeland against an onslaught of conscripts under a despotic ruler. The battle of Thermopylae, pitting 300 Spartans under their leader, King Leonidas, against 180,000 Persian troops, as dramatized in two Hollywood interpretations, the uh, most recent of which, having been based upon a graphic novel, eventually led to victory over despotic rule behind a naval wooden wall during the Battle of Salamis commemorated by the statue of the goddess Nike, the winged victory, which now famously stands at the top of the main staircase in the Museum of the Louvre in Paris, as well as providing for the name of a line of marathon and other running shoes and an American missile defense system. A bit over a thousand years later, in 1588, it was an intended Spanish invasion of England which set a small, irregular navy of privateers against a much larger armada and miraculously resulted once again in victory for a free people defending their homeland, according to a principle described by Shakespeare in his dramatic anti-absolutist political lesson to King James I titled The Tragedy of Macbeth as being the result of a passion which would create soldiers and make women fight to doff their dire distresses in opposition to forces that move only in command and nothing in love. In literature and in visual art, as well as within the historical record, as expressed by Aeschylus in his play titled The Persians, the imperative has been, go free your country, free your children, your women, the shrines of your ancestral gods and the tombs of your forefathers, as it had been in the 1942 Academy Award winning motion picture Casablanca, with its incredible scene depicting the inspiring Eastern European journalist and resistance fighter, Victor Laszlo, leading the singing of the French anthem for freedom, La Marseillaise, in contrast to the authoritarian songs of Nazism. In a wildly ironic way, this very same contrast is depicted in that annual staple of American Fourth of July celebrations. Peter Ilyich Tchaikovsky's 1812 Overture, written to commemorate the successful Russian defense against invasion by Napoleon's Grand Army, an historic event which also inspired Leo Tolstoy to write his massive epic novel, War and Peace. Then, in the uh, middle of the 20th century, there was Pablo Picasso's massive Spanish Civil War protest painting, Guarnica, and the Seventh Symphony of Dmitry Shostakovich, written during the two-year-long Nazi siege of Leningrad, about which the Russian poet Anna Akhmatova wrote, Blood of my heart, the people of Leningrad march out in even rows, the living, the dead. Fame can't tell them apart. The point in these various artistic expressions, and even French existentialist philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre's contention that he had never felt more free as an individual than while under German occupation, is not to invite complacency in the face of aggression, given that so many times invaders have triumphed, but rather to make the case that art in all genre 
can often provide in its own way a more powerful and oddly more truthful depiction of events in life in the largest sense than can be conveyed by the specific facts of history as a mere dispassionate record of particular things that have happened. It's Aristotle's concept in contrast to the philosophic prohibitions of Plato of art achieving moral purpose within society and then the question becomes how best to go about discerning and interpreting the fullest set of implications with respect to that intention. For me at any rate this entails a process involving multiple considerations whether for a text or a work of visual or auditory expression related to what I term context, content, and craft. The first of these, context, requires a sense of when and where a work of any kind was made as well as under what specific circumstances, historically, culturally, and with regard to the particular details of the creator's life, when and if that information is at all available. In terms of the content presented, I feel what needs to be considered, in addition to physical and cultural historical setting, includes principal subject matter, patterns of details, and external allusions references to things derived from other works or historic circumstances, collectively resulting in a shift in awareness that can be elicited by the thoughtful encountering of a work in terms of its potential implications. Then, regarding craft, considerations include medium, style of expression, and organizational structure. Also, there is the rationale or logic of the selection and inclusion of various elements within a work which need to be considered. In other words, why someone might choose to present what's contained within a work eventually leading to various levels of interpretation that include literal, moral, psychological, and symbolic. Working all of this out offers a sense of awareness about a piece that pushes beyond the mere description of its content toward an ongoing process of assessment and reassessment that I believe is the true value to be derived from investing the time and effort required to effectively consider the implications that might potentially be derived from a piece of any kind. As I've said before, the result of this type of mental jujitsu is often a dual level of interpretation manifest and latent surface and implied that can be obtained by asking four very basic questions what why how and so what in other words what does the work contain in terms of its medium subject matter and patterns of details internal and external references why would it include these things? How is the medium used, material, style, and structure? And then the impertinent question. So what? What importance or significance does the content and its implications seem to have both on its surface, manifest, and implied latent levels of expression? Essentially, I try to consider a work in four distinct but directly interrelated ways. Literal, what it presents to the senses, manifest content. Moral, the implications of what it conveys in terms of good or bad, 
a defense of creative work that has commonly been made since the time of Aristotle. Psychological motivations and general patterns of behavior, whether in terms of the content represented, the artist who created it, the intended audience, or the whole of the human species throughout time and across the entire surface of the earth. Symbolic, suggested meaning related to other aspects of human experience. That's my formula, for better or worse. Context, content, craft, what, why, how, so what, manifest, latent, literal, moral, psychological, and symbolic. There are, of course, numerous approaches to the interpretation of any work of art, which include perceiver response, multicultural studies, post-colonial studies, new historicism, queer theory, and deconstruction. For me, however, although any and all of these can be interesting and produce clearly valuable interpretations, first and foremost, I think that a work should be seen as an artifact, something to be considered as an expression of an individual creator's feelings and understanding, and then as a generalized depiction of human concerns derived from the universal circumstance of lived experience within the specifics of place, culture, and time. That's the way I try to think about any type of work, essentially as a kind of figurative rubic cube to be manipulated in one's mind, and it's this approach that I've tried to undertake in terms of the several literary works addressed in this sequence of presentations from heirloom books. So far, the topics have extended from the Epic of Gilgamesh to the Last of the Mohicans, from the foundation of human civilization to the transplantation of European culture into the North American continent. Along the way, what I think has emerged is a timeless picture of human struggle, of questions of life and death, of cosmic order and material existence, of passion and persistence, and of shifting worldviews in accordance with a changing zeitgeist or spirit of the age, an interpretation of experience from within the evolving prisms of culture and historical time. And so, as William Faulkner stated in his Nobel Prize for Literature Address in 1950, what gets represented in all of this is the agony and sweat of the human spirit in spite of a general and universal physical fear so long sustained that we can even bear it, while in Shakespeare's words, taking arms against the sea of troubles and by opposing, ending them. It's F. Scott Fitzgerald's observation at the end of his great American novel, The Great Gatsby, so we beat on boats against the current borne back ceaselessly into the past. And as Alfred Lord Tennyson affirmed in his poem Ulysses, it's an expression of the human effort to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. It is the recording of ongoing experience in a vibrant, artistic, expressive form that gives testament to a ceaseless quest for human dignity and freedom in keeping with Voltaire's imperative to um, tend one's garden. Heirloom Books is located at 6239 North Clark Street, Chicago, Illinois, and I'm Jeff Helgeson, Slava, Ukraine as well as the continual representation of the human spirit as it strives for freedom.